Jason Zimmer is from uh, Fisheries and Wildlife. He is the Southeast Director, uh, Wildlife Supervisor, and he, um, Deb Silva, a friend of mine, works with you, you're her boss, mm -hmm. and she contacted me and said if you'd like to have him speak on the Eagles, he'd be happy to. And we made contact, and here he is, and I'm just so happy to have you. Uh, thank you so much for wanting to come and see us today. Thank you. Over to you. Um, you know, I love doing this. I love my job. I love talking to people about wildlife, so I'm, I'm happy to do this anytime about any topic. Um, she mentioned I work for Mass Fish and Wildlife. I've been with the agency uh, about 13 years now, and prior to that, you know, when I got out of school, I worked for the federal government for a while as a biologist and did some consulting uh, for, you know, as a wildlife biologist for a private consulting firm before I was lucky enough to get the, the job that I'm in now. And uh, most days it doesn't feel like a job, some days it does, but most days I'm happy to go to work and I'm glad I get to do something that I love and, and enjoy. And just this morning I was at my uh, first grader's career day talking about my job, which was nice, and brought a snake along, which distracted all the kids. <laughs> um, I grew up southeastern Massachusetts in Situate, Mass, and then bounced around a little bit with uh, my education. I went to the University of New Hampshire and studied wildlife ecology and management, and then uh, was lucky enough through my undergraduate advisor to get connected with a professor out at the University of Wyoming and I uh, was able to travel out. Does anybody know what this animal is? Pronghorn. Pronghorn, yeah. So yeah, this is what I did my master's degree on out at the University of Wyoming, pronghorn antelope. Um, they're actually not antelope. People refer to them as antelope goats, but they're, they're, uh, they're their own unique species. But had a lot of great experiences out there before I, I moved back east. And now I live in Marshfield, which is right next door to Situate. So I basically came back home. Uh, today I'm here to talk about bald eagles. Most of you, if you are at all conservation minded or enjoy the environment, which I'm assuming most of you are if you're here today, know about uh, or know at least a little bit about the plight of the bald eagle. Um, they're, one, they're one of our worst wildlife stories, but also one of our best wildlife stories because they're one of our you know, true success stories. We've brought a species back from uh, the brink of extinction. A little bit about the agency I work for. Uh, we were originally founded as a fish commission back in 1866, but as the agency evolved through time, uh, people realized that it needed to be more all-encompassing, and you know, today we focus on all inland fish, wildlife, and their habitats. Um, I am in charge of the southeastern district, which is basically Plymouth, Barnstable, Bristol County, and the islands. Uh, the, eight, the state's broken up into five districts, and each one has a district office. Ours is down here in Puzzle <coughs> right near the canal. And, uh, each office has a supervisor, a wildlife biologist, a fisheries biologist, and then we've got four fish and wildlife technicians, a stewardship biologist, our district clerk, Deb, who, who knows uh, Elizabeth, and then uh, a land agent, and our land agent's the one who's responsible for working with us to acquire land that's open to the public for all forms of passive outdoor recreation. We're also referred to often the districts as the workhorse of the agency. We do a lot, or the majority of the on the ground field work, whether it be fish and wildlife research, habitat management, maintaining the properties that we, <coughs> we own and uh, manage. In Southeastern Mass, we have over 50,000 acres that we're covering with that small staff, so it, it can get daunting. Our agency in general were broken up into a fisheries section, a wildlife section, natural heritage and endangered species program or section. Uh, they're the ones that oversee all of our rare um, species in the state, uh, an INE section, and a reality section. Fisheries section does just what you would expect, uh, oversees and uh, manages all of our fisheries resources, our aquatic habitats in the state. Doing uh, this is one of our. This is an older picture, but we still do the same thing today. It's an electrofishing boat where we can go out and uh, sample the fish population in a pond. We have backpack units that we can do it in streams. Our wildlife section does the same thing, but on the wildlife side, um, 
research and monitoring of wildlife <coughs> populations, uh, like black duck banding, and that bear is, uh, I believe, may have passed through random. That's the, the Cape bear, the Cape Cod bear, <laughs> back a few years ago before he made his first trip <coughs> back to the west. Our Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program, as I mentioned, uh, handles all of our rare species. Uh, we have a Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, which uh, protects all of our list, state listed species like box turtle um, and plants like Plymouth gentian. Um, they also create a thing called the Priority Habitat Maps, which map uh, habitats for our rare species that then have regulatory protection. So if you're a landowner and you have a portion of your property covered by this, this map, it means that that there's very likely this, this or a number of rare species that exist on your property and certain regulations apply. <coughs> our INE section covers um, information education, pamphlets and different educational programs that we do. Our Mass Wildlife uh, Quarterly Magazine, which hopefully I've brought enough copies for everyone to grab a free one. Um, there's information on how to subscribe to it if you don't inside, but it's, uh, it's a good magazine that we put out four times a year with a lot of good information. And then some of our other educational um, publications, guidebooks, and, and things that people can either get for free or purchase depending on what they are. Uh, I mentioned our land acquisition program. This is probably one of the more important things we do because without Habitat protected in perpetuity, a lot of these wildlife species can't exist into, into the future. So um, it is by far one of the most important things we do, protecting habitat. Uh, this is our Burge Pond Wildlife <coughs> Management Area up in Hanson and Halifax, over 2,000 acres, including a lot of emergent uh, wetlands that a, a lot of species um, rely upon. And actually tomorrow, if anyone would have an interest at 10 a.m., is our annual northern red belly cooter um, turtle release. So we have, they're an endangered turtle that we take eggs out of the wild, hatch them out, and then there's different groups throughout the entire state, school groups, uh, nature centers, what have you, that raise the turtles up to a larger size, which gets them beyond uh, really the, the risky stage when they can be predated upon by a variety of predators, and then release them back out into the wild. So we're doing uh, going to be releasing 50 some odd uh, endangered turtles. The public's welcome to come. We open up the property for the day and they can go in and, and release the turtles. <laughs> Is that the ones with the Bristol Aggie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, this is just another example of one of our properties. This is Francis A. Crane Wildlife Management Area down in Falmouth. Uh, has a roughly 300 acre um, globally rare sand plain grassland that a number of rare species depend upon. And we do a lot of management out here, whether it's planting, prescribed fire, um, mowing, herbicide work, and other um, habitat projects to maintain this type of habitat. So now I'll talk about what you're here to learn about today, and that's bald eagles, um, particularly bald eagles in Massachusetts. Um, I'll try and touch upon you know, their, their biology, talk about the history of the bird, and then um, both talk about the history of the bird in Massachusetts and some of the efforts that we continue to do um, to ensure that the, the population continues to recover. Uh, obviously, the uh, bald eagle is very distinct. People recognize the adult version anyways due to the very characteristic white head and tail and dark brown body. Um, I'll talk about how they develop those. They don't, they're not born the first year with that characteristic marking. They also have the really bright uh, hooked beak for tearing flesh from fish and other prey items. And their scientific name is Haliatus leucocephalus, which is Greek for sea eagle with a white head. So it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty fitting. Um, bald eagles have, a, as I mentioned at the beginning, a really um, difficult story, uh, primarily because of people. Uh, it was due specifically to things that uh, humans did on the planet and some of the, the chemicals that we used on the planet that caused not only the bald eagle but a number of birds of prey and other species to, to go into rapid declines and I'll, I'll get into that. But um, Bald eagles are our largest 
uh, raptor in Massachusetts. We can occasionally get golden eagles passing through, which are slightly bigger than bald eagles, um, but they are the, the largest raptor we have. They can have wingspans, um, you know, in the vicinity of seven feet, and females will weigh up to about 14 pounds, where males will be a little bit less, anywhere from uh, nine to 11 pounds typically, and the females are bigger because they, they really bear the, the burden of, of producing eggs, um, which is common in a lot of uh, bird species. I mentioned they don't get their characteristic white head and tail uh, right off the bat. Uh, they start out as, as young with a really brown mottled um, coloration. The year old juvenile birds will look very similar to this one and interestingly they have some white on the underside of their wings and underside of their tail which they'll then lose um, as they grow older. So your typical first year bird, this is their plumage, they're very dark uh, brown bird. Um, you know, they can be misidentified or mistaken for other hawk species and things because people don't immediately recognize that as an eagle when they see it. The second year through really the fourth year, uh, they go through a real odd stages of getting different patterns of white and brown. Uh, oftentimes they're referred to as dirty birds because they look like a, a white bird that had been rolling in the mud or you know, a bird that's, that's dirty. But that's what a typical second year or two year old bird will look like. And then it's not until that third year that they start to get a real inkling or start to show a, a bit of the white head and tail pattern. They still have that modern, mottled white and brown uh, on their body. And, and this is really, I think, where the term dirty bird really came from because it, it looks like they have a white head, but it's, it's just dirty for some reason. Fourth year, they're almost there. And interestingly, you know, four years old when they're starting to look like a mature adult is when they start to um, sometimes breed, you know, four years, five years is when they fully mature and will begin to breed. And then once they reach that fifth year, they look like the characteristic <coughs> bald eagle with the um, stark white head and tail and brown body. Here's just an example of uh, a bald eagle on the left and that's a golden eagle on the right. They are really virtually the same size. Golden Eagle's just a tish bigger. Um, and we do sometimes have these. I believe this picture was taken at Club and Reservoir. Um, so we will have Golden Eagles passing through Massachusetts from time to time. So that's one species that they're often mistaken for. Believe it or not, more so than Golden Eagles, these are the two species that get reported as bald eagles to us. <laughs> Almost inevitably, when we get a call about a dead bald eagle on the side of the road, it's, it's a goose. People drive by, they see a big bird, it's got black and white, it's an eagle, and we want people to report it. I'll send my staff out every day of the week when we get a call if they say it's an eagle. Because <coughs> if it's an injured eagle or a dead eagle, we want to know about it, we want to get it. And, you know, also, we do banned geese, so we could collect some important information from banded geese. Another bird over here on the left that was mentioned in the, the intro of the osprey, um, because of their habits and where they tend to hunt, they're a fish, uh, fish eating bird. Uh, they're often referred to or misidentified as bald eagles because they're seen near water, seen taking fish. They do have white and black on their bodies. I'm not sure this will work, but <laughs> most people haven't actually heard a bald eagle uh, or what they sound like. And if this works, we'll see. Okay, did it, could you hear that? Okay, so if you watch a movie and you see a bald eagle soaring around, 90% of the time that's the sound you hear. Does anybody know what bird of prey that actually is? Okay, so it's... It's a red-tailed hawk. Yeah. yeah. So maybe because it's charismatic sound or whatever, you see a movie, just pay attention, you see an eagle, and then you hear a red-tailed hawk sound. <laughs> Eagles actually, this is, sound like a sparrow. Yeah. So they're chirping, you know, when we're going to Eagle Nest, this is the sound that we're hearing as they fly around overhead. and and try and chirp at us to encourage us to not climb into their nest. Yeah. 
the bald eagles range pretty much throughout North America. Um, this is a little bit of an outdated map, but they're, they're pretty much all throughout North America, Alaska, um, down into Mexico, parts of Central America. Uh, in Massachusetts, they're found statewide. Um, and in particular, in the wintertime, uh, we have you know, a higher density of eagles in the state than, than during the breeding season, like right now. Um, their typical habitats are large bodies of open water. They're a fish-eating bird, primarily. Uh, so they've gravitated towards large bodies of water, whether it be a lake, pond, river, um, major rivers and streams. I and mean, they also want some undeveloped shoreline where they can nest, perch, preen, and, and, uh, and fish from. Typical nests are found along the shoreline. Um, you know, we, we typically don't find them any more than you know, maybe 100 feet from the shore of these ponds and, and rivers. Sometimes uh, they're a little bit further away. More often than not, they're right on the edge or right out overhanging. Look down here in this part of the state, white pines are the most common trees for them to nest in. But uh, along like the Connecticut River Valley, uh, along the edges of the river, they're in big cottonwood trees. We do have a tree, um, a big red oak uh, nest in southeastern Mass. And they're going to be anywhere from, you know, this is a typical tree, anywhere from 75 feet to well over 100, 120 feet up in the trees. Um, they're, they're typically found, you can kind of make up the nest here towards the top of the tree, but they do tend to like to have a little bit of uh, canopy or vegetation above the nest. And the reason we think that is is because it provides a little bit of added cover for the nest. So when the female's in there incubating and when the, when the chicks are young, it gives them cover both from <coughs> precipitation, rain or snow, whatever it might be, and also from the sun, because it can get really hot up there. I, I can tell you that much when we're sitting there up in the tree waiting for our staff on the ground to process the chicks. Um, just sitting there can get really hot. So having a little bit of cover helps. The nests themselves can be anywhere from four to eight <coughs> feet wide and four to 12 feet deep. And they've been known to weigh thousands of pounds. Um, most of our nests aren't quite that big in Massachusetts, but uh, they do, we do have some pretty sizable nests. The winter habitat for the eagle is a little bit different, and it's basically um, still these large water bodies, but they really f congregate in areas that have open water. So in the wintertime, one of our biggest winter wintering areas in the state is Quabbin Reservoir because it's one of the last places to freeze up. We also have a high concentration of birds around the Assawampsit Pond Complex and Lakeville Middleborough um, because those again take a long time to freeze up and then the entire coastline so it happens with a lot of bird species, waterfowl and that's part of the reason wintertime all the inland water bodies and lakes and ponds and streams freeze up all those waterfowl that were once spread across the inland are all congregated to the open water on the coast which eagles also eat waterfowl, ducks, wading birds, so they're, they're congregated on the coast a lot in the winter in Massachusetts because of the high prey and access to open water still for fishing. Um, some of the typical wintering areas in Mass are the more dense wintering areas. I mentioned Quabbin Reservoir, Connecticut River doesn't uh, freeze up very often, so that will winter birds um, up in the Merrimack. Uh, Aswamps at Pond Complex. Another area we've been finding a lot of birds in the winter is down around the east and west branch of the Westport River. And then, you know, these show concentrated areas like the North River and part of uh, kind of the Plymouth Duxbury Bay area. But really, <coughs> the entire coastline in the wintertime is, holds a, a large number of eagles. I mentioned that their primary food is uh, fish. You know, they're a fish-eating bird. They have strong curved talons and extremely good eyesight. So they'll, they'll perch or just hover over the water looking for fish just under the surface. And they're very skilled at pulling fish. As well as, got it in here. One of the most interesting things that I found 
when we started doing the turtle nests, I mean turtle nests, eagle nests, is finding musk turtles. For some reason, the size, habits, or whatever of this turtle, um, we find musk turtle shells in almost every eagle nest, and for some reason they must like them and are able to pick them off pretty easily. I never would have guessed that eagles eat turtles, but they, they do, and they seem to, to make a pretty good living on it. Why they like large water bodies? It's because large water bodies tend to hold large numbers of large fish, like this smallmouth. That's uh, a few years ago, my older daughter Kate, she got to come out on an eagle banding trip. And uh, what we typically do is, while we're there, we try and catch a couple of fish from the water body so that we understand when we climb into the nest, we take the chicks out, we lower them to the ground, there's a level of stress there. And one way we kind of make ourselves feel better about it, because the eagles, I'm sure, can feed their young just fine, is we stick a couple of fish in the nest when we're all done so that they have a, a meal to distract themselves and, and pick away at while they're waiting for their parents to come back. <coughs> Even when inland water bodies freeze up, they still provide food in other ways. Uh, you can see um, there's a lot of things like deer. Uh, it's pretty common at the Quabbin and other large water bodies for deer to get out on the ice, their legs give out, their hips break, and then they provide food for other animals. So it's not uncommon at all to see something like this that was pictured at Quabbin. Uh, I was at Halfway Pond two winters ago um, observing because we have a, half, a nest there in Plymouth. There was a deer carcass out on the ice and we had eight eagles on it. Um, and you can notice here, one thing to notice is the different age classes of birds. So you got, you know, five-year-olds, probably four-year-old birds, three-year-olds, and then a couple of juveniles. So they all will key in and, and intermingle uh, on food sources in the wintertime. This is, you know, one of the unfortunate reasons why they're drawn to places like Quag and this food sources like this yearling deer. Eagles also prey heavily upon waterfowl, um, ducks, geese, gulls, other water birds. Uh, they actively and, and aggressively hunt them throughout the year. Uh, particularly in the wintertime, it provides a, a good food source when some of the other fish species aren't accessible. And surprisingly, they will go after birds as big as this, this swan. I mean, the, the swan probably outweighs the eagle three times, um, if not more, and they still will go after them. And shows you how, uh, how formidable they are. Excuse me, what, are they just flying in together? Are they No, the eagles, friendly, or? The, no, the eagles okay. attacking the swan, trying to, trying okay. to kill it. Um, this looks... Like they're not being friendly, but it actually is part of their breeding, um, one of their breeding behaviors. Eagles have one of the most unique courtship behaviors um, that I've ever seen. I mean, some of the stuff you see on planet Earth with those bower birds and other things that have elaborate displays, those are amazing. But uh, eagles will actually, in midair, they'll join together and then tumble. If you try and look it up online, there's videos of it. And it looks like they're in trouble and they're tumbling out of the sky and they'll just tumble head over the heels and then let go at the last minute and swoop out. They won't hit the ground. And that's one of their, uh, the, the courtship rituals that they have. They will breed year round and they'll exhibit, you know, courtship behavior year round. You know, they call it cuddling. They'll be on the branch together, you know, touching or rubbing up against each other. They'll preen each other. They'll share food. They will work on nests year round, um, although typically the, the peak of nest building and maintenance is going to be that, that stretch of time uh, leading up to when they breed. In Massachusetts, the, the peak of breeding tends to be the first couple of weeks of March. So they'll breed and then there's a, a period there about two weeks when the female will lay between one and three eggs. Um, during that month or two leading up to breeding in, in March, January, February, that's when they're going to be carrying sticks, they're going to be adding to their nest, make, preening it, making it just right. And that's a time of the year when we get a lot of good reports from the public. 
you know, if you see an eagle carrying a stick, it's with a purpose. They don't just fly around carrying sticks. They're, they're going to a nest location. So we do get a lot of good information, and we've discovered new nests just from somebody saying, hey, I saw an eagle today flying over this section of road with a stick going in this direction, and that gives us uh, a clue to go start looking for a nest in that Do area. Do they go back to the same nest every year? <laughs> they will. Um, you know, they mate for life, so they, okay. and they'll, once they build a nest, they'll typically return it every year. Uh, if the nest gets destroyed in a storm, a lot of times they, they, they like that tree, they like that location, they'll come back and build right in that same spot. Sometimes, as I'll get into later, even to a fall. Uh, mentioned that they lay between one and three eggs, uh, the average probably being two, um, and the incubation period is about 35 days, so they're going to hatch out uh, really typically sometime in the first couple of weeks of April, um, and that's what we see in Massachusetts. We actually just wrapped up, was it yesterday or no, Tuesday, we just wrapped up our last eagle banding for the year. Uh, because the the age typically we don't want, we want to handle the chicks somewhere between about four and a half weeks and uh, maybe seven 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 and a half weeks of age. Beyond that, they get a little uh, unruly to handle. Our typical nest trees I mentioned, you know, big white pines. Uh, this is uh, a big red oak tree on North Watupa Reservoir in Fall River. Um, this time of year you can't really make it out, but if you're traveling on 195, uh, let's see, west, and you, you'll come up to North Watupa Reservoir and you're right, if you look up the western shoreline, shoreline when the leaves are off the trees, you can't miss a giant nest sticking out on a point, and that's um, a bald eagle nest that's been there for a number of years now, and it's been our most, uh, it hasn't been our longest standing, but it's been our most productive nest down in southeastern Mass. It, almost inevitably, they, they have three healthy chicks every year. So the eggs are, are rather nondescript, um, oval, about almost three inches long, two inches wide. Um, the chicks, when they first hatch out, uh, they're, they're pretty small, but they grow rapidly. By about, this is probably a four and a half week old chick, so they, they go from in an egg two to th you know, three inches long to something rather large. And you can see this right here sticking out, that's the crop. That's, so that's where the, the food that that eagle has recently ate is stored, so this bird is obviously eating well. And they start to slowly lose this down and, and it's replaced with feathers over uh, the coming weeks. They grow very rapidly. Um, these birds are probably in that eight or nine week age range, and that's about when, right around eight weeks is when they first start. You know, even before that, the, when they're four or five weeks old, you'll see them kind of just practicing their wings a little bit in the nest. When they get to be about eight, nine weeks, that's when you'll see them start to do this. They'll flap and hover above the nest. They'll flap up and perch above the nest and drop back down, and that's all of that is is practice and it also builds up their flight muscles so that they, they can then take their first flight, which typically happens around 10 weeks. Once they take that first flight around 10 weeks, they hang around their nesting area for quite a while. They're still learning. They're still learning how to, um, how to hunt from the parents. The parents will still actively feed them. Um, and unfortunately, that first year of life is really hard on eagles as it is with a lot of wildlife species. Mortality rates are very high, sometimes even upwards of 80 percent, 90 percent. So to get through that first year uh, successfully for an eagle is tough. Once they do, then their survival rates go way up. We do see a lot, um, a lot of birds that will be roughly in that year old time frame, either late fall, early winter, or over the winter. They come up a sick eagle and really all it is is they're emaciated so they haven't been able to feed themselves well enough their flight muscles have deteriorated and then they're on the ground and they can't fly and a lot of times we can take them into a rehab facility at Tufts get them fed up and um, that might be the boost they need to, to make it through but it's 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 tough that first year of life I've never really confirmed this was not my slide that we had a bird come all the way down here 
Um, what I think this one was, was a bird that came from somewhere else and was rehabbed in Massachusetts and banded and made its way down there. But typically the dispersal distance of the birds is around 100 miles or less from their nesting territory. And that's important to remember when I get into the recovery of the birds and how we went about trying to jumpstart the recovery of the birds in Massachusetts. Does anybody know why bald eagles declined? DDT? See DDT? DDT, yeah. So DDT is the primary, primary reason why bald eagles declined so rapidly, but also because of persecution by people, just direct killing. There have been, for a long time, it was mistakenly thought that birds of prey are terrible, they're, gonna, they're taking our livestock. Um, you know, really there was a bad stigma and a bad public perception of all predators. Um, in, in Alaska, for a long time, there was a bounty on eagles. So if you turned in an eagle, I think you'd get, a, you know, however many dollars and it's estimated that I think well over 100,000 eagles were killed under that um, bounty. Now you look at videos from Massachusetts and it's like going to the landfill and seeing gulls. There's just so many eagles, which is a great thing, um, but we're not quite there yet and in the rest of the range. When, uh, you know, I mentioned DDT, does anybody know why DDT caused a decline in eagles and other species? Yeah. No. It may be the shell's soft, right? so that the parents would break the eggs. Yeah, exactly. So the different aspects, you know, when you use something, you know, pesticide or anything in the environment, it accumulates and gets taken up by various things. So how DDT worked is some of the derivatives of DDT built up in the, you know, the little phytoplankton and moved up through the food chain. So as smaller fish ate the phytoplankton, Bigger fish ate those fish, bigger fish ate those. What do eagles like to eat? Really big fish. So it just bioaccumulated. And then as eagles, ospreys in particular, that eat large fish, they started to accumulate these toxins. And what it did is it limited the ability of the eagle's bodies to produce calcium, which made, hard, made for hard eggs. So what actually was happening is, you know, they were still laying eggs, but the eggs were just crushing underneath the weight of the eagles. Um, and that, that was the primary thing that led to the decline uh, of the species. So through that and through people killing them, uh, population was really nearing extinction, particularly in the lower 48 by the 1960s. Uh, there was a law way back in 1907 in Massachusetts um, and this really was, you know, light years ahead of everything else that happened to protect eagles. But Massachusetts passed a law in 1907 prohibiting the hunting of eagles in Massachusetts, which really didn't do much because the last nesting eagles in, in Massachusetts up until the recovery time was in 1905 in Sandwich. So eagles weren't in Massachusetts anymore once this law was, was put into effect. And this is, I think it's a picture from Alaska of two eagles that someone shot under the bounty program to, to turn in for money. <coughs> the first uh, significant uh, federal uh, act that went into place to protect eagles was in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And what that did is prohibits taking, killing, or possessing of birds themselves, parts, nests, eggs, or products from the birds. But birds of prey were not really added until 1962. And that time frame, 1962, um, was an important time frame when it comes to eagles. Another protection that was put into place federally was the Bald Eagle Protection Act. And that really, again, it didn't do a whole lot, but it did protect the direct killing and taking of eagles but it wasn't really enforced. Laws that came before the Endangered Species Act that we all know were the Endangered Species Preservation Act in 66, where eagle, bald eagles were listed as endangered on that um, about a year later. But that did little but eff authorized efforts to acquire habitat, which is important, um, but it didn't do anything to really recover the species. 
And then the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1969 added a little bit more protection, um, but really was focused on ones in, in danger of worldwide extinction. The big thing that happened that really was the turning point for bald eagles was when DDT was banned. Um, part of the reason that there was national attention put on DDT being banned was a book by Rachel Carlson that maybe you know called Silent Spring, and that brought to light on a national level uh, really the impacts of DDT and, and on not only eagles but other species. And you know, Silent Spring, that's because the birds aren't calling anymore. And that led to a transition to other pesticides for agricultural and other uses. The Endangered Species Act that we still have today was passed in 73, listed species as either endangered or threatened. And that protected eagles. Eagles were listed as endangered, later were downgraded to threatened, particularly in the lower 48, and today um, they are no longer on the, endangered, the Federal Endangered Species Act. So some of these laws and regulations that were put into place, they started to solve the problem, DDT, and direct killing of eagles by people. But there was still the issue that the eagle numbers were extremely low, and efforts were undertaken both in Massachusetts but throughout the species range to recover them. And what you see here is this is uh, folks from our agency and other cooperators building what's called a hacking tower on the Prescott Peninsula at the Quabbin Reservoir. And I'll get into what, uh, what that means in a minute. <coughs> This is the tower that they were just building in the last photo, and you can see a young eagle up in the tower. And what this is is basically to simulate a nest. Um, we got eagles from a number of uh, states um, in the Midwest, um, some from Canada, and some from, um, some from Maine and New York, I believe, and brought them to Massachusetts and hacked them out in this tower. And what that basically means is people with very limited contact with the birds, would come up, feed the birds, raise them. They would see this as their nest and get them through that 10-week time frame, and then they'd open the front doors. They're on the Quabbin Reservoir, which is fairly undisturbed, large fish population, a lot of suitable nesting habitat, with the hopes that when the birds fledge, take their first flight, that they'll like the area, see it as home, and start to establish nests. So. I believe this was started in, in the early 80s, 82, 83. Uh, after several years, the first nest was observed at the Guaman, and it was birds that came from this, this hacking effort. So slowly <coughs> but surely, the birds were slowly fledging. They're seeing this habitat. I mentioned they typically only dis distribute about 100 miles from their home range, so even if they don't stick at Guaman, the hope was they're going to establish a territory somewhere in Massachusetts and start breeding. Excuse me. Yeah. Being raised in, in the cages there, how did they learn to hunt without a, a parent there? Yeah, well, some of that's just um, Instinctive? instinctual. So I think that, you know, we obviously can't teach them that, right. but they, they have the instincts and they learn pretty quickly. It's certainly not as, as good as seeing and being witness to your... Uh, you know, your parents doing it in front of you, but it, it does work. These poles were put out on here for just the reason I mentioned earlier, for them to get out, stretch their wings. <coughs> they were allowed to come and go as they please and still were provided food for a time, a time period until they got it on their own. Sometimes, unfortunately, their first flight doesn't go so well, but we had staff there basically around the clock when this was going on. Um, to be able to go out and rescue the bird, bring it back to the tower, and give it another shot. So you can take a look at the, the time frame, and this doesn't come all the way through present day, but it gives you the, the story. Um, looking back, you know, way back in 63 when, you know, Silent Spring and, and efforts to try and ban DDT had started, you know, we were at a, a real low as far as bald eagles in the lower 48. 417 pairs throughout all of the lower 48 um, is, is, is pretty significantly low. Um, to, you know, Endangered Species Act was passed right in here. And then a lot of states started into this recovery phase. So eagles were recovering on their own through natural nesting, but through efforts like we did here in Massachusetts, 
we were able to get the population kick-started again, and now we're, we're growing uh, exponentially with the eagle population. So if you look at Massachusetts, um, fledglings in particular, we started back here, and the blue are territorial pairs. So the first time we saw a territorial pair was back in 87, and that was you know, four years, five years after we started the hacking program, and then the first nests in the wild were discovered in 1989, and then it's been a fairly steady exponential growth since then, um, to the point today where we have probably 60 nests, possibly more that we don't know about in Massachusetts, and every year we're getting new nests. We have multiple new nests in the Southeast District this year, um, and then we try and closely monitor all of those, but you know, just in 2016 alone, we fledged over 60 new chicks into the population in Massachusetts. And fledging, by that I mean the birds made it all the way through that 10-week period and left the nest. Um, obviously, survival is low the first, first year, but things are continuing to trend in a, in a good direction. This is the current distribution of our bald eagle nests in Massachusetts. You can see heavy concentration out here around the Quabbin Reservoir, Connecticut River, Merrimack River, um, and then down in southeastern Mass, we've got the east branch of the Westport River. This is a new nest that we're, we discovered this year, our first year nesting birds uh, on the Taunton River. It's actually on the Bristol Aggie campus. Um, we went out, we climbed this nest on Tuesday after we did another nest in the morning. Unfortunately, there was no eggs or chicks in the nest, but it's common the first year that they just do what's called housekeeping. So they're first year birds, they go through the motions, they build a nest. Unfortunately, there was no chicks this year, but we're hopeful it's a good nest, good location that they'll, they'll be back next year. This is uh, the Assawampsit Pond Complex. We have two nests <coughs> here. Um, in Middleborough Lakeville. This is Halfway Pond in Plymouth. And this is Silver Lake in Pembroke. Um, other areas, we do suspect that there are other nests in southeastern Mass. And, yeah. Is there one in Wareham? I see a bald eagle in Wareham all the time. So. I'm going to get into suspected <laughs> okay. nesting areas, but yeah. Um, the bald eagle was removed from, it was on the Endangered Species Act for a long time, basically ever since it was listed in 73. Uh, it was down, downgraded to threatened a um, number of years ago, and then in 2007 it was removed entirely from the Endangered Species, the Federal Endangered Species Act. It is still listed under our Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, so there's, there are still protections, and still the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Bald Eagle Protection Act, and other um, regulations still protect the bird. So the species has essentially gone from virtually extinct uh, or in, in great risk of becoming extinct back to um, stable population. It's one of our, you know, there's not a lot of wildlife success stories that we do have, but the eagle is one of them. And it's, you can teach a really important lesson to people, you know, especially when I'm talking to kids, it's, we cause this species, which is, you know, it's really like the national symbol of freedom. It's on the post office trucks. Native Americans revere the species. We almost cause it to go extinct, but we were also able to change our ways and through proactive efforts get it back to a point where they're now abundant again throughout much of their range and even becoming common in Massachusetts. We still require reporting of uh, eagle sightings and one of the ways that we get, you know, this is an unfortunate way we get reports of a dead eagle, but one of the ways that we get reports is through the bands. This, this is the state band that we put on. These are the federal bands. Nobody's reading these with binoculars. The only re way you're reading these is in hand, but the reason why we have these state bands, gold is our Massachusetts color, and then you can see there's unique codes on these, and these are meant to be big and readable by binoculars, spotting scopes, cameras. Um, so we get a lot of reports of birds um, with these bands. They report the numbers. We can then look up where the bird was originally banded 
And if there are other reports of it, it's history so we can determine where it spends its time, where they disperse to, um, and what might be going on with that. And people, when they, you know, when they report the bands and they get to learn a little bit of that information, it, you know, it's, it's nice, it makes them happy as well. Uh, any dead eagles that we have turn up, go into a Native American uh, repository where they're then used uh, for ceremonial um, and, and other cultural um, programs with the Native Americans. We continue to protect habitats. So our nesting sites in particular are protected uh, with signage and if possible uh, boating restrictions and other things, but there are a number of properties across the U.S. and in Massachusetts that have been protected um, permanently, whether it's federal land, state land, or um, other sort of town or nonprofit conservation land to protect eagles and their habitats. And we continue to monitor the species. Just because we brought them back to a point where they're recovered, considered recovered in the lower 48 and on their way to recovery in Massachusetts, it doesn't mean that there aren't other threats that are going to come up, and it doesn't mean that they're out of, you know, out of the dark just yet. So it's important that we continue to monitor these species. And that's what we're doing with you know, the bands and, and our efforts to climb into the nest. This, I believe, is uh, at Halfway Pond in Plymouth. So every year, um, myself and a number of my staff will go out and other folks across the state and we'll climb into um, the safe trees to climb. If the tree's not safe, we don't climb it. We just monitor it with uh, binoculars as best we can. But we'll climb up into the nest, uh, take the chicks out. We have an intricate pulley system and bag system. We lower them to the ground where they're weighed. Uh, sometimes we take various samples from them, so blood, a uh, feather for looking at different toxins or lead. Um, and then, uh, check their crops, put the bands on, and get them back up as quickly as possible. And my wife thinks that we do this just because it's a lot of fun, and I won't lie, it is, it is a lot of fun. This is, uh, this is the nest on North Watupa Reservoir in a big red oak tree um, in Fall River. And so this is two of my staff on the ground uh, putting the band on the, on the eagle chick. This is an older bird. Um, this is about the maximum we want to handle uh, handle them. They can they're a little, they're not really dangerous. They, they've got I mean if I might have a picture that shows the talons. If, if you could see their talons, you would never want to touch them. But they're like little floppy things. They don't even they could probably grab you and hurt you, but they don't quite know what what they're doing with them yet. So they have all the tools to cause you severe damage. They just don't, haven't quite figured it out yet. This is probably a seven, seven and a half week old bird. Um, virtually fully fe feathered out and on the, on the big end of what we typically like to handle. We weigh the birds. This is Bill Davis. He started with our agency working in that hacking tower and you know he's one of the ones who's directly responsible for a lot of the birds. Um, that were raised out of that tower. He's my counterpart in the Central District, so he works out of West Boylston. Here we are putting the federal band on a bird. That's probably a four and a half, maybe five week old bird. That's perfect size. Um, really, the four and a half week old cutoff is only because we want their feet to be full size, because if not, there's the potential that that band could slip down over the, the talons a little bit, and that could cause a real problem. And that was what I'm talking about with the talons. You know, we're talking inch and a half long, very sharp, um, but they just they just don't know how to use them just yet. They haven't figured it out. So they will bite a little bit. That's more about the worst thing that they do to you at that size. And you would think that you know the one question I get all the time about climbing into the nest is, aren't you scared? What do you wear? Don't you think the parents are going to attack you? And surprisingly, the adults are like big babies. They, they, they'll fly around and they just try and use their size to intimidate you. They do that little chirping, which isn't intimidating at all. Um, never will they come down and try and hit you, come near you, anything. Peregrine falcons, some of the hawks, 
whole different story. When we go out to ban peregrine falcons, you better have a helmet on, you better have heavy gloves on because you know they're going to constantly be trying to hit you. So you either put your hand up and let them hit your hand or they'll, they'll rake their talons across your helmet. They're very aggressive. Eagles are not so much. They just fly around, make a little bit of noise. Sometimes they just fly off and leave and come back later. So they're not, they're not too concerned. So other than us, who are their natural predators? Do they have any? Um, when, they're, when they're young, so the eggs can be taken by, on very, very rare occasions, you could get a raccoon or a fisher that would climb up into the tree. That's, I've almost never heard of it happening. Um, crows, if they're, the parents aren't around, crows can go in and steal the eggs, eat the eggs, or eat young chicks. Um, occasionally, like a greater blackback gull, you know, a big gull could go and try and eat an egg or a chick. Um, owls, on occasion, have moved in and taken chicks out of the nest, but for the most part... How about an osprey? It's us. Osprey will not prey on the young or the eggs, but they will... Um, they have been known to push eagles out of an area. So we've had eagles try and take over so an osprey nest. Titan nest then. No, there's ospreys right there, yeah. yeah. So um, they wouldn't have destroyed the nest. No, but sometimes we've had eagles try and go in because they, they find a nice nest that an osprey has made, and they try and take it over, and then the ospreys come I've back. Watch the osprey go after the eagle. Team up on them and kick them out of there. The Westport nest. Uh, on the east branch of the Westport is an old osprey nest. They tried to take it over the first year, the ospreys kicked them out. The second year, they, they stuck with it and took over the nest, and now it's an eagle nest. Um, I mentioned owls will occasionally try and take a, a young chick out of the nest, but it's, it's pretty rare. Their, their biggest threats are starvation, getting hit by vehicles when they go down and try and eat carrion on the road, um, or occasionally fights with other eagles. Mention some of the samples we take. Um, you know, we, we'll, we'll always look around, and we don't do it as much anymore because we have a pretty good idea what they eat. But any food items, we'll, you know, especially if we bring kids along, you know, they love to look around under the nest to find fish bones and shells and other things, so that we can get an idea. Gull feathers, um, get an idea of what the birds' food habits are. Uh, we take blood on occasion for lead testing, uh, mercury testing, and then we've taken feathers and other things for the same type of testing to assess their health. How long do they typically live? Um, in the wild, you know, say 20, um, 25 years is a, is a pretty good lifespan. I think the, up until it just happened this year, the oldest living bald eagle was like, known was like 36 years, and then one just got hit on the road it was either late in the fall or early this year uh, that was 38 years old. So, but I think 2025 is, is more typical. Um, you know, and I mentioned they do mate for life, but if they lose one of the pairs, they will readily pair up with another bird and, and mate for life with that bird. I mentioned we try and protect the areas and the nests, so boating restrictions. Um, trying to keep people out of the immediate nest area to reduce disturbance on the birds. But as we're learning with a lot of wildlife species, eagles are highly adaptable and we're finding them nesting. Like you wouldn't figure a, an eagle would nest you know, where they are on Watupa Reservoir. Even though North Watupa is close to boating, got tons of huge fish in it, they are within eyesight or within a stone's throw of 195 and Route 24. It's very busy. We have birds uh, nesting in areas, you know, there's one in a cemetery in Waltham that I climbed last year that it's right in the middle of the cemetery. There's people in and out of it all day long, lawnmowers. Uh, the one in Westport is in a cattle pasture. There's cows underneath it. There's a house being built within 100 yards. So they're, they're proving to be more tolerable than we thought. We do, as you, know, you asked about predators, we do put on most of the trees, a predator guard, and then you almost can't see it here. It's because I've got some good spray paint artists for the that work for me. But we try and put a predator guard just to prevent something from climbing up. It's so rare that it's probably unnecessary to do, but 
Um, we do it anyways because you know maybe it makes us feel better. <laughs> they seem to appreciate the fact that we put up no trespassing signs around their territories. That's uh, I think that's out near the Quabbin Reservoir. So to talk about some of our nests in southeastern Mass. This is last year. This is the two healthy chicks, probably around that nine, ten week age frame, at our Westport uh, East Branch of the Westport River nest. Our longest standing nest in southeastern Mass from '92 is on Poxia Pond in Middleborough, and they have this pair has moved their nest from tree to tree a couple of times, but that's our longest standing. And just make note, they've fledged. 36 chicks since 1992. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, I mentioned earlier that you know, somebody asked if they go back to the same nest, and I said a lot of times they do, even if it gets destroyed, they go back to the same thing, sometimes to a fault. That is this pair, Great Quiticus. They're on a Nuxanon Island. They were in a good tree. One of the branches, you know, it had a nice fork at the top like this that they built in. One of those branches snapped off in a storm. The nest fell out. They tried to build back in that spot multiple times, and every year either they'd lay eggs or they'd have young chicks, a little bit of wind, the nest would fall out. They went to another tree that was great, perfect tree, fledged chicks. Where are they again this year? Back in the tree where the <laughs> nest has fallen out. But they somehow managed to get it in there this year where it seems pretty secure, and we climbed this one last week and banded um, chicks out of that nest. But if you look, to a fault, they've been there since 2004, nesting every year, they've fledged five chicks. That doesn't include this year, so I think it's six now. Excuse me. Yeah. I've seen on, on the internet there are cameras where you can watch watch the birds in the nest. Is it your organization who puts those cameras No, there? we have <coughs> cooperated with um, there was a nest at Barton Cove out in the Connecticut River for a long time. It was a cooperative effort with, I don't know if it was National Grid or some electric company. Um, I don't think that that nest is still online anymore because the tree that they were in became unsafe, so they couldn't maintain it anymore. We have talked to a couple of the, the folks where we have nests. You need you know, to do that down here because I, I love the ones that are out there, they're just so neat to watch. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping that we can get one up in, in the southeast district. One lends itself in particular to it because it's on a closed you know, water department property. There is power right nearby where we could do it, and I think that they would be a good cooperator. So um, I don't believe our agency has any up working right now, but there are quite a few out there. This is the North Wetupper one that I mentioned in Fall River. The other one was active since 2004, has fledged five or six chicks. This one's been active since 2006, and they've fledged 27 chicks. Make that 30 because there's three in the nest this year. So you can see um, how productive this pair can be. This is a highly protected area, great location. I just hope the tree holds up because it's got some uh, insect damage on it. Halfway Pond in Plymouth is one of our newer nests. This is on a protected island in the middle of Halfway Pond. If you go to our Halfway Pond wildlife management area, there's some cranberry bogs on it that were uh, that are operated by AD Makepeace. We have a conservation restriction on them. <coughs> it's a great place to walk in, set up a spotting scope. You can see see the nest, see the birds there almost daily. Uh, first found this in 2012. They, as of last year, they'd fledged a total of 11 chicks. There was one this year, so there's 12 fledged out of that nest now. This is one of our newer nests. We just found out about it last year. It may have been there for multiple years. This is on Silver Lake in Pembroke. This is one of the ones that's a little bit further away from the pond than typical. It's in a very high white pine tree. Uh, fledged two chicks last year. We just banded two chicks this year out of the nest again. And it's, uh, it's protected by City of Brockton Water Supply. So this is the one that I think lends itself to uh, one of those cameras if we're able to, to work with them and figure out the logistics on it. Thank and you. Silver Lake is a closed water supply, a lot of fish. Yep. Yeah, I have another question. You know, I watch a lot of these wildlife programs and yep. so forth. And you know, I notice you show two or three growing up and fledging out of a nest that you talk about. 
some of these programs show that you know one one bird hatches before the other, and it becomes dominant and actually kills off the other one. But that doesn't seem to be the case in any of the things you've shown us. Yeah, well, it it is the case to a degree. One, they lay their eggs over a course of a few days. One hatches always hatches first, and that bird, you know, the the reasoning behind it is it gives that bird a head start on food and gives it. Uh, the best chance for at least one out of the nest to, to survive. Um, what we're finding here is we still have very low densities of eagles and mass, and where where these nests are, there's abundant food resources. So it hasn't really played out uh, too much to that effect. But that is the the reasoning or the evolutionary thought is that one hatches first, gets more food, gets a little bit bigger. There's always one in the nest. We have two. You know, I think in Silver Lake the other day, one was eight and a quarter pounds and one was seven pounds. So there is one that's got a head start. I don't think that they typically will, um, in this case, eat the other one or kill it. But if it came down to it, what typically happens is the biggest one or the biggest two will get access to all the other, all the food, keep the other one away, and then that one's just going to basically waste away and, yeah. and, and die. This is the nest on the east branch of the Westport that I said they took over an osprey nest. It's in a dead black locust tree, big nest, it's a great spot, um, and they've been fairly successful. This is one we cannot climb, but we can easily see it. We got permission from the landowner. We can see right into the nest uh, with a spotting scope or binoculars. All these photos I've shown of this nest came from our staff photographer, Bill Byrne. That gets me to other potential nest locations. Um, the one that's most uh, interesting or important would be the Mashpee Wakeby area on the Cape. The reason being is the last nest I mentioned earlier in Massachusetts was in 1905 at Snake Pond in Sandwich, which Snake Pond is, uh, I don't know if this is it, yeah I think this is Snake Pond here. Um, so they're right in that same general vicinity. This would be the first nest on Cape Cod since the last nest on Cape Cod and the last nest in Massachusetts. So we've been getting multiple, multiple reports every year for the past three years of adult eagles <coughs> right from December through breeding period and right through the summer to where you know, probably somewhere within this aerial photo, this is uh, Mashpee Wakeby here. So somewhere in this general vicinity, there's an eagle nest. We're almost certain of it. Uh, we just don't know where it is yet, so we've been really pumping up uh, the public down there to try and um, go <coughs> wherever they're seeing them, because it will be noteworthy when we find that nest. Another few areas where we've been getting reports, Manchester Reservoir and Attleboro. Um, eagles were seen last year carrying sticks there. We think there's a nest somewhere in that vicinity. We just don't know where. It could be across the uh, border in Rhode Island somewhere, but we're keeping an eye on it. Taunton River, this was on here before we found out about the Bristol Aggie Nest. Um, we were getting a lot of reports of eagles in the Taunton River in that area, the brickyard near Bristol Aggie. And now that we found the nest, we know where it is, but Taunton River is a, a perfect place for more nests to pop up, mm. so we're keeping an eye on it. The Agawam River and Mattapoisett River down in that general vicinity, but Agawam River and the Wareham area we get a lot of reports of adult eagles this time of year for the past few years, so we think there's probably a nest. And You would think an eagle nest is easy to find, but they, they really aren't, even if you know where they are. I did see the eagle in November. I was driving on Main Street at 7.30 in the morning, and it flew right in front of my Jeep, and it yeah. was an adult with the white head and tail. And then towards the end of the summer last year, I saw the strangest thing. There's ospreys all over down there. I mean, I've got nests everywhere around near where I live. Yeah. So I'm used to seeing ospreys, and I'm, I've seen eagles before, but I've never seen them together. So I was my morning walk, and all of a sudden there was something going on overhead. I looked up. It was an eagle fighting an osprey for the fish the osprey had. Oh, yeah. And the eagle was going after him, and I couldn't believe the difference in size. I mean, the eagle was so much bigger than the osprey, which ospreys are pretty big. Mm -hmm. I just watched that happening, and the osprey was really good at maneuvering and, and like getting away from the eagle, and it finally the eagle gave up and, and went somewhere else, but 
I never thought that they'd go after an osprey for a fish. Yeah, that's actually pretty common. They do go after osprey for fish yeah. quite a bit. Now, yeah. ospreys literally dive into the water and grab their fish and propel themselves out. Now, do eagle, eagles don't dive into the water? Don't they just kind of grab it off the yeah. surface? Yeah, yeah. The osprey, you, you'll see them a lot. They'll they'll flap and yeah. they'll hold a position, then they almost they drop straight down and plunge in. Eagles will will more come at it in the sore and, and grab, and grab as they're coming by. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I have a little more respect for the osprey. I mean, they hit that water really hard, oh, yeah. and then they bring yeah. themselves out. Yeah, there's even there's videos online you can see when eagles will take fish that are so big that they can't carry them, and they'll hold on to them and basically flap and swing yeah. their way to shore to, to get out and feed on it. Yeah, but yeah that, that Aguam River area is, is... So you haven't actually found an eagle nest? No. All right. So yeah, anybody, you know, we really encourage the public from, you know, January through July, if they see adult eagles, to let us know, because that, that's a good indication of a nest nearby. I'll let the Wareham Land Trust know. Did you do a bear talk for us? I did. Okay. Yeah. And so when you say let you know, um, informally with a phone call or using the... Uh, um, either is fine. I mean, we take a lot. Most of them come in via the phone or an email. Yeah. And then the North River, uh, I live in Marshfield, and people started calling me about eagles on the North River this year, and which isn't uncommon because it's one of their wintering areas, but then they started saying there's two, they're adults, they're here all the time. So we went and we looked and we ended up observing the two eagles and we saw them carrying sticks. We haven't found the nest location, but again, this is going to be another instance of first year <coughs> birds. Almost certainly not going to be on a nest with eggs this year, but they're housekeeping, and we're hopeful that you know next year we'll have a nesting productive pair on the North River, either in Marshfield or or Situate. And um, there are a few other spots. I mentioned the Mattapoisa River. We've been getting quite a few reports of adult eagles on the Mattapoisa this year, um, down on the south end of the Mattapoisa. So we continue to monitor the eagle population through our banding efforts. We do an annual spring um, bald eagle survey that we used to do in the, in the winter time, but we moved it to the spring to more mm -hmm. coincide with when they're nesting and get an idea where the nests are. But we're continuing to monitor, monitor the population, uh, periodically take samples from the chicks to look at their health. If we end up with any sick or injured eagles, we um, evaluate them, find out why, um, and it's all goes in line with keeping, you know, keeping vigilant on this species. It's one that's been been brought close to extinction in the past by uh, by our own actions, and that doesn't mean that there's not going to be some new threat out there or some new thing that we're doing that we thought was a good idea at the time, but now we uh, we find out later that it, it really had an impact on wildlife, and that's important because. All species that, that I'm responsible for protecting, that you know, all of us care about, they're all intertwined, they're all connected via the ecosystem, and their fate is linked directly to our fate, and the, the health of the planet, and the health of all these species um, depends on us, and, it, and is tied to our own health. You know, so at one point, bald eagles were almost gone, um, and even still in Massachusetts, Seeing a bald eagle, I mean, I still get excited every time I see one. I see them more often than, than most people because we work with them and monitor them and know where they are, but I still get excited and, you know, sometimes when I see the videos of, you know, the most recent one I saw was Alaska, a fishing boat, and the guy had a bowl of chunks of fish and he turns around and there's probably 40 eagles on the boat and he starts throwing fish and they're all coming like you would be feeding ducks, you know, somewhere. And, and even with that going on, it doesn't take any of the excitement out of it for me because they're, they're such a unique species and, you know, they're, they're so important in our, our nation's history. So um, we should all still in Massachusetts consider ourselves lucky to see them. <clears throat> and with that, I'll take any questions you might have. It doesn't have to be about eagles because we deal with everything and I get questions about everything you can imagine. So, yeah. I saw a program uh, recently and it was on... Uh, the uh, snow owl, and they showed they got into the flight of the snow owl and how it could fly without making any 
wind noise. And watching all your uh, eagles, uh, I notice on the end of the wing, there's all like fingers. Yeah. Does that have, or what does that have to do with the flight? Those are their primary feathers, so those help them maneuver and, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, owls in particular have a very, you know, a lot of the owls have evolved so that, I mean, they're, there's no sound when they fly. Right. I've seen some of the, you know, there's a number of different programs on them because they rely so heavily on sneaking up on, you know, mice and other things like that. But, you know, whereas eagles, you know, the, the fish aren't going to hear them. Yeah, the birds might, but yeah. um, they, they more reply, rely on stealth and the owls really re rely on, they're stealth, but sound is so important in the way that they hunt. Right. Yeah. As far as your organization is concerned, how did that bear get up on the cape? <laughs> the most likely scenario was that it swam across the canal. Really? Yeah. Oh. It was It was seen, it was up a tree, because I got the call. You know where the little red schoolhouse is? Yes, I off, do. Yeah, exit two. <coughs> it was up a tree right off the parking lot of that in the evening. The next morning it was on the cape, and that was... It was a Memorial Day weekend, so there would have been a constant stream of vehicles that's, going over that bridge. That's what somebody said to me. It had to be the bridge. I said, impossible. Yeah. How much traffic on the bridge? It wouldn't have gone over the, the bridge without some of you, because there's, on that weekend in particular, there's traffic constantly going and over the bridge. And they're capable of fighting that, that tide yeah, the sewer, well, that rush? It, it must have timed it, timed it luckily with the you know, mat or close to slack tide or, you know, they're good swimmers. That bear swam across a number of the tidal channels that are ripping pretty good down uh, down Cape too. So that's the most likely scenario. People think they know what, there's no way it could swim across, but a bear can swim all the way across a lake without blinking an eye, so. Where'd you move the bear to? Uh, when, we first, when we first got the bear down in Wellfleet, we brought it out to the Douglas State Forest. And the reasoning behind that was we wanted to put it somewhere on the leading edge of the bear, bear range. So we, we had enough bears in that general area that there was a likelihood, you know, a year and a half old male, he's out roaming, it's breeding season, that he might encounter some other bears and stay put. Wasn't the case. <laughs> You know, it was like three days later, he was in Brookline. <laughs> so then, yeah, yeah, when we first caught him, I tagged his both ears. And then after he was in Brookline, we brought him out to the Prescott Peninsula in the Quabbin, where we have a lot, you know, high density of bears, and he's hasn't been heard from since. <laughs> I've, always, I've always heard that if you touch these animals, the mother doesn't want to come back to them. If they smell, you know, a human to touch them. I guess that's not true. No, I mean, well, birds, most birds have no sense of smell oh, anyways, oh, but oh. even with like, well, where I'm going after this is to deal with a deer fawn. Um, even with, you know, like white-tailed deer, they have an incredible sense of smell. You know, but we found, you know, that motherly instinct will overcome a lot of, a lot of that. So even when somebody's had a fawn in their house, gotten human scent all over it, you put it back out where they took it from, and the mother hears it, finds it, they'll, they'll pick it right back up. Um, you know, and that's public service announcement. If you find a white-tailed deer fawn hiding in the grass and you don't see the mother around, it doesn't mean it's abandoned. It means it's doing what it's supposed. They rely on their camouflage for protection. So, yeah. Do you have a list of deer-proof shrubbery? <laughs> um, I'm not sure anything is deer proof, but uh, there might be some plants that are less desirable. That they don't like lavender. Oh, they don't like lavender. If you can plant lavender around wherever it's going. In. Yeah, that's why. That's probably why some of the lavender. You know, you can, one of the deterrents is soap, you know, fragrant soaps, a lot of those have lavender or other smelly perfumes in them you can try and hang up. Yeah. Do you have any knowledge of the, uh, the new koi wolves that we have here? Yeah, the, um, that's a term like that a lot of people, you know, some people actually throw around the koi wolf thing. And really they're, what they are, they're, they're coyotes. We don't call them koi wolves. What it is is um, when humans 
basically wiped out the wolf population or, or extirpated them east of the Mississippi. Coyotes from the west slowly expanded because coyotes and wolves typically don't mix very well. They slowly expanded eastward and at one point or another as they were expanding their range eastward they interbred with wolves. So the coyotes that have been here since the 50s, the coyotes that are here today are still the same. They all have tiny trace bits of wolf DNA because of that history of when they when the they expanded. The asking, uh, well, I saw a thing on the internet that the, the coyotes here will wander all the way to Canada and breed and come back. But I've got them right here in Britain, on Britain Street. Yeah. I was out there with the tractor the other day and probably 120 pounder. And last year there were some too. And they're beautiful. Yeah. But they're they're big. I yeah, mean, our they're coyotes. Bigger than a German Shepherd. Our coyotes are are significantly bigger than yeah. their Western. Well, I lived in, yeah I lived in San Diego when they were only about well, 35 or 40 pounds. Yeah. Our I mean, we hunters and trappers take probably five to six hundred a year, and we get data off of a lot of those. So that the average weight of adult coyotes still in Massachusetts is somewhere from 35 to 50 pounds. Yeah. Average weight of a western coyote is probably 35 pounds. So they are bigger. The biggest one we've ever ever weighed it was just over 60 pounds. And I'll tell you, if you saw that animal in the wild, you would say, no problem, well, it's it over 100. Have a lot of fur, thick fur. Yeah. You would say, but hands down, there, you'd say it's over 100 pounds seen it in pretty, the wild. Pretty shabby. I saw a lady one time in San Diego that I'd seen her out with a, a dog, I thought, on a rope. And I would always be in traffic. And there she is, and she's got about a 60 foot rope, this old lady with this dog. And I said, What kind of a dog is that? It's beautiful. And she said, It's not a dog, it's a coyote. Huh. She said, I found it, because there's a lot of coyotes, and you know, they lose their mothers. And I took, took it in as a puppy and hand raised it. And I said, it, Fur is so thick and it's so big. And she said, they're, when you hand raise them and give them food every day, they totally change. Yeah. Our coyotes are pretty well fed, too. There's plenty oh, of yeah. food for them. Well, there's a, a bear on King Phillip Street here a couple months ago. Yeah, we were hearing, uh, I just heard about that. I was, where was I? I was at a meeting the other night and somebody asked me if I'd heard about a bear in the random. Taunton area or really? something like mm -hmm. that. And I had, we hadn't gotten any reports of it, but... They'll cover a lot of territory pretty fast. This is there. the time of year, late May, <coughs> late June, when when we have had bears come into this part of the state, it's almost always a dispersing young male that got kicked out, you know, a year and a half, they got kicked out from the mother during the breeding season, which comes in June, and they'd strike off looking for their own territory. So this is the time of year. I feed birds myself, but this time of the year I don't because they come looking for the, the the bird food as well as all the wild turkeys. Yeah. It, it, is it possible, you, you know, you said a bit, that the people who live behind me have these outdoor cameras in yep. this motion center, and she has pictures of uh, fisher cats, I guess it's called. Oh, yeah. uh, that's a good sized animal too. I wonder if that was mistaken. What is it? Fisher cat, is that the correct oh, term? Fish, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh. Fisher is the correct term, they're not actually a cat. Right, I understand. Yeah, um, you know, a big fisher is probably, you know, a really big male is going to be 13, 14 pounds, but they look, I mean, we have a mounted one on our office wall, they look what? They look big. But I, I had to deal with a, a picture that was floating around on a f town Facebook page in the town I live in, Marshfield, where somebody said, it's a bear, and it was just a head-on picture, and it was a fisher, 100% a fisher, yeah. but you know, it, it looks like a bear. I was going to say, maybe that's what was, because it worries me that there are bears. It's it pretty, sound uh, pretty wild at night when they're doing that screaming action. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's, like, it's like there's a murder going on. Yeah. Yeah. My husband was a deer hunter, and he used to deer hunt on Nantucket. And he used to say that the deer swam over there. How did the deer get on Nantucket? The deer, the, the theory is, and this, you know, there's data to support it, is that there was deer brought over there. Uh -huh. um, the records show or you know, say that it came from two individuals from the Midwest. And there's actually, we're working with a researcher at, 
because Bridgewater or Framingham State that's doing a deer genetic study specifically looking at that question. And they found, they have found the genetics, the DNA microsatellites or whatever do match up with Midwest. But they also found a, one that matches up with like somewhere in Connecticut. So they're going to be doing collecting DNA from deer all across southeastern Mass. <laughs> it's coming fall to further pare it down, but it does support the idea that deer were brought over there. They did swim out to the Elizabeth Islands and likely from there over to Martha's Vineyard. So that's how the deer got out on those islands. Yeah. I have a friend here in Rainham who raises um, peacocks and has other uh, poultry. And she was commenting that red tailed hawks seem to be more abundant and larger around. Uh, I, I wonder, do they um, migrate and are we seeing more of them? Um, I wouldn't say we're seeing more of them. There are, there's a lot of red tails around. We're seeing, we've seen an increase in broad wing and red, particularly red shouldered yeah. hawks are more abundant and they're nesting a lot in suburban areas, broad wings and red shoulders. Um, but the red tail, red tail population, I wouldn't say has increased dramatically, but there's, there are a lot of them around. You see a hawk and, you know, an easy way to seem like a hawk expert is nine times out of ten, it's going to be a red-tailed hawk, so you yeah. can say, oh, it's a red-tailed hawk. But, yeah. Yeah. Is Mass Wildlife still pursuing that program of putting rattlesnakes on an island in the Wabbit Reservoir? The, um, <laughs> there's still, a, well, we have, like with all the other rare and endangered species, we have a, um, a program looking at rattlesnakes. We've been working with rattlesnakes for years and years, and um, there's a fairly recent, I think it's, it's either bacterial or it's a, I think it's a skin fungus that started to affect them. So a number of years ago, we started taking rattlesnakes and they've gone to a zoo in Rhode Island and captive reared and then re-releasing them. And that's part of what that was, was identifying because one, the snakes where we know that they are are affected by the, the fungus. So they're likely, a lot of them are all hibernating in the same area, able to pass it off. Part of the thinking behind identifying other areas, suitable areas to release them was to establish new populations that weren't threatened in the same way. And also, um, one of the areas, or two of the areas where we know we have the snakes now are also in areas that have high human traffic. So they're at risk to people killing them, taking them, what have you. So. There is still conservation going on with snakes, but we're taking a step back and looking statewide. And it may very well be that Mount Zion, that island in the Quabbin, ends up being a site, um, but looking at identifying other sites as well. But there was there were some folks um, and some politicians that, that came out pretty, concerned. you know, like pretty, uh, boisterously against or concerned about about putting snakes there. Um, you know, I won't touch on whether that's warranted or not, or the fear is warranted, but uh, we are certainly still concerned about conservation of rattlesnakes and all rare species. You know, just like bald eagle was, you know, once in really tough shape, rattlesnakes are actually in really tough shape right now, so it's one of the species we're concerned about. Even though some people don't like them, they're scared. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you.